Hello, fifth grade. We're going to read a story today. It's a true story. It's an extraordinary true story of the American Revolution. It's called Henry and the Cannons by Don Brown. It was the winter of 1775. The American Revolution had begun and things weren't going well for the Patriots of Boston, Massachusetts. The British Army held the city. They thumbed their noses at the surrounding hills where General George Washington and his soldiers stared down at them. The British and Washington both knew the modest American army had scant chance against the world's best soldiers. Washington ached for cannons. With them, he could rain cannonballs on the British, British soldiers' heads and drive them from Boston. But Washington had none. At Fort Ticonderoga, New York, there were many cannons. In May, Colonel Benedict Arnold had snatched the big guns as well as the fort from the British. But 300 miles of lakes and rivers, hills and glades, and mountain forests separated Boston from Fort Ticonderoga. Dragging the cannons the whole hard way in winter was impossible, wasn't it? Henry Knox said he could do it. Knox was a Boston bookseller who taught himself soldiering from some of the very books he sold. In spite of a plump shape that suggested a man who preferred a good meal to a good fight, he was an eager patriot who was sure he could bring the cannons to Boston. General Washington believed Henry and ordered him to Fort Ticonderoga. Covering 40 miles a day for a week of hard riding on horseback, he was rain-soaked, wind-blown, and frozen. The trip was nothing like selling books. It would be the easiest part of his adventure. At the fort, Henry set about choosing the best cannons, some big, some small, 120,000 pounds of cannon, 59 in all. He gathered men to help him on the journey back to Boston. First, they heaved the cannons to nearby Lake George, where Henry had arranged for three boats to sail part of the way home. Henry and his band set sail over icy waters. Along the way, one boat snagged a rock. With ropes water-soaked and slick, the crew manhandled it free. That night, Henry and his tired men found shelter with Native Americans. Henry declared their food relishing. They must have been really hungry, huh? The next day, a wind sprang up very fresh and directly against the boats. They had to be rowed hard for hours. Muscles and breath burned. Wind-driven waves washed over the boats, sinking one. Wet and cold, Henry's troop refloated it. After 10 days and almost 40 miles on the water, they reached the end of the lake. Henry loaded the cannons onto 42 sleds provided by local patriots. Oxen and horses started hauling them over snowy roads, but the weather warmed and the snow disappeared. The sleds sank in the mud and stuck. Certain the snow would return, Henry decided to scout the route ahead. He was alone and off the beaten path when a heavy storm blew in. Snow filled the air and piled high on the ground. His horse refused to go further in the wintry gloom and deepening drifts. Henry trudged for miles before reaching safety. I had almost perished with the cold, he said. But the sleds could be moved again. The oxen and the horses dragged them over frosty trails and across frozen rivers. At one crossing, some cannons crashed through the ice into the water. Henry refused to leave any cannon behind. Pulling and tugging, lifting and yanking, hauling and lugging, Henry's men rescued the drowned cannons. <laughs> 
The caravan had been struggling for about a month. They reached the Berkshire Mountains of Massachusetts and the road nearly disappeared. With shouts and cracking of whips, Henry and his band urged the straining oxen and horses forward. In Boston, Washington watched British, British soldiers in their bright red uniforms marching Boston streets, eating Boston's food, and sleeping in Boston's beds. Using poles, ropes, and chains, Henry's men wrestled the cannons over the sheerest cliffs and down the steepest heights. Snow swarm around their boots and cold chilled their hands and faces, but no one quit. On and on, Henry and his men trudged. Eventually, dizzying heights became steep slopes, then gentle hills, then a regular road and towns appeared again. Many of the townspeople had never seen a cannon. In Westfield, Massachusetts, Henry fired a big gun and thrilled everyone. Finally, about 50 days after leaving Fort Ticonderoga, Henry reached General Washington outside Boston. Not a single cannon had been lost. Nearly three months later, 2,000 Americans scrambled up the hills overlooking Boston in the dark of night. With 300 ox carts and wagons, they hauled wood and barrels to make a fortress for Knox's cannons. They finished by dawn, the daylight revealing a nasty surprise for the British. Seeing the big guns pointing down at them, 9, 000, the 9,000 British soldiers fled the city by boat. They left behind 250 of their own cannons. The Americans won back their city and a great victory. It was March 17, 1776. George Washington led a joyful parade into Boston. Beside him was Henry. And that's our story. Henry and the Cannon.